So last month, we saw the latest low-end GPUs launch from both AMD and Nvidia. And while both cards maybe didn't get the best reception from reviewers or consumers, one had more flack than the other, the 6500 XT with its four gig of VRAM. It just seemed to bear most of the brunt, especially when comparing it against the Nvidia RTX 3050 with double the amount of memory and a whole host of other goodies to give us technologies like ray tracing. Not that it really made much of a difference due to the crippling performance that came with it and consequently needing other features like DLSS to bring it back in line. So with both of these cards priced roughly the same, we thought we'd put them against each other in a good old fashioned head to head. With the slightly cheaper price point of the 6500 XT, is it really enough to ward off the RTX 3050 or has Nvidia done enough to dominate the 1080p gamer market? There's only one way to find out. Let's do this. Oh mate, you all right? Yeah, just got all the bits from my banging new gaming PC. Just got to put it together. It's going to be so much better than yours. Oh, right. What did you get then? The latest Intel 12th gen processor, a feature packed motherboard and 32 gig of DDR4 memory. See, miles ahead of yours. <laughs> you, you realize that board needs DDR5 memory, don't you? Don't tell me you went and bought the wrong stuff. DDR4 is so 2014. I can't believe you was that stupid. <gasps> what? No, you're joking. What should I get then? For me, I'd be looking at Corsair's newest Vengeance DDR5 kits, or if you're wanting that all important RGB, then go for the Dominator Platinum RGB. Oh, you are a lifesaver, thanks. But where can I find out more? By clicking the link in the description below, of course. <laughs> and you call me the stupid one. So first things first, let's get pricing out of the way because we can tackle it in one of two ways. The first being the MSRP, which for the 6500 XT comes in at 179 pounds in the UK and $199 in the US. Though typical, let's call it street pricing, sees the Sapphire card that I have here at 199 in the UK and for some reason, no availability in the US. Though based on other cards like the ASRock Phantom Gaming D, you could expect it currently for around the same kind of $258 mark. Quite a bit more kind of disparity in the US than this side of the pond. And no wonder why we actually get a ton of comments when we make a video about prices dropping. While it's happening here, for some reason that just doesn't seem to be the case, at least in the US. When looking at higher spec models of the 6500 XT, like the Gigabyte Gaming OC, we obviously see higher prices, around $278.99 in the UK and $299 in the US, potentially giving better cooling performance and of course quieter operation, as well as maybe slightly better performance overall due to the overclock speeds of the card. Moving on to the RTX 3050, the MSRP comes in slightly higher at £239 in the UK and $249 in the US, but unlike the 6500 XT, it seems to actually be harder to get and then for a reasonable price. I mean, looking at some of the models of the card, the Zotac Twin Edge OC being the cheapest was £329 in the UK, but was out of stock. While the cheapest model in stock was the Ventus 2X OC from MSI at £349.99. In the US, the cheapest model I could find was the Eagle OC from Gigabyte at $349, but again, it was sold out. While the cheapest card in stock technically was the Gaming OC that kind of formed part of a bundle with an A520 Micro ATX board from Gigabyte. But likely no one wants or that you'd actually be pretty hard pressed to sell on after purchase. Now, one thing I do want to get out there is that prices change and not even just on a daily basis. I've actually seen prices of graphics cards go up and down throughout the day. So I guess what I'm trying to say is all prices that I've quoted here are just what I've seen at the time of filming. So please just bear that in mind. So if you have 350 pounds or $300 to spend on a new graphics card, are you better off buying the more expensive RTX based GPU or going for the 6500 XT and utilizing the savings in other areas like a better CPU or maybe even more memory? Well, to find out, we took both cards and ran them at their rated speeds on our X570 GPU test system with a Ryzen 9 5900X, Notchua D15S cooler, 32 gig of Corsair Domplat 3600 MHz memory, and a Zeus Crosshair 8 Dark Hero motherboard. Due to the kind of, let's say, 
low end nature of the cards that we are testing, we ran our tests at both 1080p and 1440p and deemed 4K to frankly not be worthwhile. We also ran our tests on the release drivers of each card to make things as fair as possible and all tests were run on Windows 10 with all of the latest updates. Also to keep things as fair as possible, we're looking at both the Sapphire 6500 XT Pulse and EVGA RTX 3050 XT Black as technically they are both deemed as <clears throat> MSRP cards. Now, before we get started, if you want to see all of our testing data, we will be posting that up on our Patreon, which the link is below. So if you want to see that and, you know, fancy supporting us at the same time, then that would be greatly appreciated. So starting with synthetic benchmarks and 3D Mark Firestrike, which saw the RTX 3050 from EVGA come in around 6% higher than the Sapphire 6500 XT. Though coming in around 30% more expensive, it does make you wonder if 6% is really worth the extra cost. Moving on to Firestrike Ultra, which tests at a slightly higher resolution, we see the gap draw ever closer with only a 2% lead given to the EVGA card. If this is anything to go by, I personally wouldn't be spending the extra money on the Nvidia based GPU if 2% is all that's in it. Though remember, these are only synthetic benchmarks and gameplay may show us something different. Running a couple more synthetic tests and Time Spice saw a much larger lead given to the EVGA 3050 of around 22%. Clearly the DirectX 12 based benchmark is favored more towards Nvidia and we start seeing more of a reason to kind of spend that extra cash. In TimeSpy Extreme, the same gain of around 22% pushes the EVGA 3050 XC Black ahead of the Sapphire card. So far seeing AMD trailing behind in every test we've run. Taking a look at 3D Mark Port Royal, before even running this, I knew Nvidia would dominate here with their dedicated RT cores. And this shows with a whopping 614% lead over the 6500 XT. Makes you wonder why AMD even bothered to put ray accelerators on a card like this. But if you've seen our 6500 XT launch day coverage, you'll know that that wasn't our only gripe with the card. In our last synthetic benchmark test and Unigen superposition, the RTX 3050 again is leaps and bounds ahead of the 6500 XT by around 34%. As we move through our data, it just seems that the 6500 XT, albeit cheaper, doesn't have any opportunity of even coming close. So with our first game, Assassin's Creed Valhalla, at 1080p on the high preset, the 6500 XT trailed behind the RTX 3050 by 38%, with the 3050 comfortably sitting above that magical 60 FPS number that most gamers crave. While the 6500 XT is still playable, personally, I'd be tweaking the settings down slightly in the hope of increasing that FPS. At 1440p, the gap was extended to 54%, though both cards did struggle to get anywhere near 60 FPS. And while it could be achieved by dialing down some graphic settings, if wanting to play Valhalla at 1440p, you may be better suited to a GPU with a bit more power, but obviously that's gonna cost you a bit more money. In Borderlands 3 at 1080p on the medium preset, both cards sat way above 60 FPS. Again, the RTX 3050 was leaps and bounds ahead with a 32% lead. At 1440p, that lead grew even more to a 53% gap between the two cards with the 6500 XT sitting below 60 FPS, while the RTX 3050 sat comfortably at an average FPS of 75. Though we're only two games in, I'm already starting to see a bit of a pattern here. Moving to Dirt 5, which is always favored AMD based cards, we do see a smaller lead given to the RTX based card at 28%, with both cards, albeit only just on the AMD card, sitting above 60 FPS. At 1440p, that gain was increased upon again, with the RTX 3050 just teetering below 60 frames per second, while the 6500 XT slumped down to around 37, giving us a staggering 50% lead to Nvidia. Clearly the 6500 XT isn't favored at the higher resolution, though at this point, it's not doing too great at 1080p either compared to the competition. Moving over to Godfall, a fairly newish title that again favors AMD and the gap drew somewhat closer, though still saw the EVGA 3050 ahead by 19%. Our lowest disparity at this point, though is it even worth that extra cost? I'm sure a lot of users would argue a resounding yes at this point. Similar to what we saw before at 1440p, that gap grew even more with the Nvidia card coming in at over 50% faster than the Radeon card. Again, is there any hope for the Radeon at this point? In Horizon Zero Dawn, while both cards managed to stay above 60 FPS, the 6500 XT only just peaked above at 62 frames per second. At 1080p, the RTX card managed to keep the lead at around 30%. 
At 1440p, that lead again grew dramatically, holding a 71% lead over the RX 6500 XT. Just goes to show that the 4GB of VRAM really is hindering the performance of the card, and Nvidia don't seem to have anything to worry about. Another game that's generally favoured by AMD hardware is Shadow of the Tomb Raider. Again, both cards had respectable frame rates above 60, though the AMD card only just managed to get above it, and the Nvidia GPU holds a massive lead of 40%. At 1440p, that increase grew even more, with a 61% lead given to the RTX 3050. At this higher resolution, that lack of VRAM really does make a huge difference, and it's clear to see why Nvidia went with 8GB over 4 or even 6. In Watch Dogs Legion, nothing really shocked us here, considering the game is geared more towards Nvidia hardware, seeing a modest gain of 21% over AMD. With that being said, the 6500 XT still presents a playable frame rate, and if wanting more, the settings could be tweaked to increase performance. That lead then doubles when moving up to 1440p, where both cards sat below that 60fps benchmark that gamers like to be above, though the 6500 XT was significantly lower again, likely down to that lack of memory and of course, the PCI Express interface. So now things get very interesting when looking at ray tracing performance. While both cards do offer ray tracing gameplay, it's clear to see that Nvidia have a huge lead at 1080p of over 140%. The dedicated RT cores really do make a difference, even in titles that are engineered to work better with AMD based GPUs. An even bigger lead of 175% to the Nvidia card was seen at 1440p, with an average frame rate dropping to 18.2 FPS on the Radeon GPU showing that it just frankly can't keep up, especially when it comes to ray tracing. In Forza Horizon 5, while it's unclear on where ray tracing effects are fully prevalent, we still saw a 23% lead given to Team Green, though the 76 FPS that the 6500 XT managed to get is still nothing to snub your nose at, and for a title that looks as great as this, it's actually managed to impress me. Slightly. The same can be said at 1440p, while the RTX card naturally still managed to keep a healthy gap between the two cards of 34%, both cards managed to give respectable frame rates to this resolution. Sure, the 6500 XT was below 60fps, but only just, and gameplay still looked pretty smooth when testing. In Godfall, we did notice that ray tracing doesn't seem to function as it should, and instead gave similar results with ray tracing disabled, at least on the Nvidia card. Still, for the sake of comparisons, it's worth noting that the 6500 XT basically grinded to a halt at 1080p. At 1440p, it was a similar story of 8.8 .8 frames per second, and clearly shows that AMD still has a lot of work to do to keep up with Nvidia when it comes to ray tracing, even if it's just RT shadows and not full-blown ray tracing. While we normally do test more ray tracing based titles, sadly the likes of Metro Exodus Enhanced Edition and Watch Dogs Legions both don't support ray tracing on the 6500 XT, so we can chalk both of them up as a win for Nvidia. While I guess giving AMD a did not finish, or well, a did not even start for that matter. So from the benchmarks, it's not looking great, is it? And at the start of this video, I put a point across that the RTX 3050 is a more expensive card overall. So is it worth the extra cost, even if it does perform better? And really, that all comes down to how much the card actually did perform better. But there are other areas that I guess need to be highlighted too, because while performance does make up, I guess the majority of a reason as to why someone would buy a graphics card over the other, there's actually a lot more to it than that. Starting with the RX 6500 XT from Sapphire, while it's branded as part of their pulse range, it does come with a factory overclock, though only of 10 megahertz on the boost clock, taking it up to 2825 megahertz. I mean, AMD even touted this card as having the highest clock speeds of any card. Though we've seen that while that looks great in terms of marketing, in the real world, doesn't really mean much. Now, one area where this card will be favored by some is the size of it and its kind of compact design. While not branded as an ITX card, it comes in relatively small at 194 millimeters long, 107 millimeters wide and 40 millimeters high. Design wise, it's pretty understated, mainly with a black plastic that houses the two large Pulse branded fans and a full black PCB backplate. Though the card does feature kind of red accents throughout, which may hinder your PC's theme and your overall design choice if red isn't for you. But hey, it's AMD, it's meant to be red, right? Due to the overclock and the twin fan design, the board power is slightly up from the rated 107 watts reference spec, and instead comes in at 130 watts by way of a single six pin PCI Express connector. 
This does also mean even a modest 400 watt power supply should have no issues with this card, obviously depending on the rest of your system specs. So one key area where the card is lacking, apart from the four gig of GDDR6 memory and a PCI Express 4.0 X4 interface, is in the display department. And something I was quite critical of in our launch day video, which you should definitely go and check out. The fact that it only has a single HDMI port and a single display port connector kind of alienates a market where users may want to use this, say less for gaming, but more for productivity. Though on that note, the lack of H.264 and H.265 encoders and AV1 decoder may already kind of make that decision for you. So moving to the RTX 3050 from EVGA, it's part of the XC Black gaming range and not to be confused with the slightly more powerful and consequently more expensive XC gaming range. Speedwise, it's an MSRP card with no overclock. So instead comes in with the reference 1,777 megahertz boost clock. Though pre-overclock models are available, but it's just gonna cost you a little bit more money. Much like the 6500 XT, the EVGA card is very compact in form factor, coming in at 201.8 millimeters long, 110 millimeters high, and takes up just two slots inside your case. In terms of the design, it's very stealthy, as the name would suggest, with an all black shroud that encompasses the two large EVGA branded, and when I say that, I mean heavily EVGA branded fans. The blades have kind of little E's all over them, which some will like, and some, like myself, maybe just aren't too keen on them. The rear of the card doesn't have a backplate. And again, this is reserved for the slightly more expensive and pre-overclocked XC gaming model. EVGA have managed to keep power delivery to the reference spec from Nvidia of 130 watts, but unlike the 6500 XT, this comes from a single eight pin PCI Express connector. Again, allowing this card to be used with quite low spec systems with a lower wattage power supply. Another key area that is likely why we saw such good performance in comparison to the 6500 XT, especially as the higher kind of 1440p resolution came into play, comes down to the fact that this card comes with eight gig of GDDR6 memory and also utilizes a PCI Express 4.0 X8 interface instead. And the last key area that differs is the RTX card comes with three display port connectors and a single HDMI, meaning multi-monitor support is much easier to use and configure on this card, as opposed to having to daisy chain on the AMD card. Now, obviously each card has specific features from both AMD and Nvidia, and this kind of all equates to extra added value. So I guess really it would be a bit unfair for us to at least, you know, not touch on each of them. So the main one for AMD, thanks to its RDNA2 architecture, which would kind of be a bit of a saving grace, at least in terms of performance, comes down to Fidelity FX Super Resolution, or FSR, which helps to upscale the resolution, which could see those frame rate numbers jump up depending on A, the title, and B, the graphics quality settings used as Firstly, not all games are actually supported. Now, while there are other technologies, I guess, within the Fidelity FX range, which are all encompassed under RDNA 2, most are actually based around making gameplay look better in terms of lighting, shading, and reflections, but nothing that will increase the performance at the same level as FX Super Resolution. In terms of Nvidia, through the power of the Ampere architecture, separate RT cores and Tensor cores, you have the ability to get the very best visuals through ray tracing without kind of compromising too much on frame rate like we saw with the 6500 XT. Now, while this still kind of gives you, I guess, frame drops, there's still scope to increase the performance through the likes of DLSS. Though again, it is title dependent and graphic settings will play a role too. Now, one key area that Nvidia does also win the battle in is that it has all of the tools that I guess any budding editor or streamer will want, including seventh generation NVENC encoder, the fifth generation decoder, reflex, broadcast, and so much more. So definitely, I guess, some extra added value to Team Green on this one. AMD, I think you might have lost this one. Now, throughout this whole video, Nvidia have basically given a metaphorical bitch slap to AMD in every test but there is one area where AMD, I guess, have the upper hand, and that comes down to power consumption. So the Sapphire card came in at 189.7 watts at load, while the EVGA RTX 3050 drew a little bit more power at 221.5 watts. So I guess you could argue one way that AMD is the more efficient card, but on the other, 
the more powerful card used more power. It's definitely funny how you can skew an argument any way you want. Now, when it came to temperatures, AMD again came in the victor by a stonking one degree, which really you could argue is margin of error and retesting over and over could see the RTX 3050 and the 6500 XT trade places. So in my opinion, I kind of see this as a little bit of a moot point. So the last area where again, the 6500 XT comes out on top comes down to noise levels. With a decibel reading of 40.5 decibels compared to 43 decibels of the EVGA card, it's a small victory, but a victory nonetheless, and something that likely won't make any difference whatsoever when inside your PC, and especially if wearing headphones when gaming. But we're trying to kind of be as fair as possible here, especially considering the battering that AMD took in the gameplay tests. Now, one area that I wanna be transparent about is that we did run these tests on a 5900X to alleviate any bottleneck. And yes, the likes of smart access memory or resizable bar are available to use with both cards. But I can't see anyone spending the kind of money that these two cards actually demand and then having the latest motherboard and the latest CPU that support these features as well. So we decided to run our test with these features off. Hopefully you guys agree that's the best way to do it. So the evidence is pretty clear. The RTX 3050 is the superior card in every test, whether it be synthetic or gameplay and again at various resolutions. And that's just kind of one big part of the puzzle. The other comes down to efficiency, which AMD seems to be the better card at face value. But kind of like I mentioned, so much of that comes down to it also being an inferior card where it matters, performance. It's like comparing a diesel car with a supercar. The diesel would look great in terms of miles per gallon, but where it matters, speed and power, it's not even comparable. And that's kind of, I guess, how it felt here today. Now, obviously there are other areas like features and technologies, but again, it seems AMD are maybe lacking there too, especially considering the lack of display connectors and lack of encoding and decoding features. <sighs> I really am trying to find something to make this a fair fight, but I kind of feel like I'm clutching at straws to find anything. I mean, you all know me, I like to see it from both angles, but sadly I just can't really find a reason to buy the AMD card over the Nvidia card. Apart from one thing, I mean technically two, pricing and availability. As I said earlier on, the 6500 XT is the easier card to get and is the cheaper card to get. But I think we can clearly see from the results today that it's easy to see why. Do people just kind of not want it? It's almost at the price it should be. And looking around at other cards, it looks to be the card with, I guess, the closest price to its MSRP. But the lackluster performance, lack of display connectors and missing features that are, I guess, important to quite a broad spectrum in the market, just simply seem to, maybe see it being ignored by the majority of consumers looking for a graphics card on the cheaper end of the scale. The RTX 3050, it's clearly the better card to buy. And I'm not just talking about on the performance side of things. It just seems, I don't know, maybe it's just me. It just seems to be the better kind of rounded GPU based on the features that will, I guess, appeal to gamers, streamers, and budding editors. But you have to remember, the features that are baked into the architecture of this card are, in essence, exactly the same features that we see on the ultra high-end RTX 3090. It's just, essentially, I guess, the performance that's been scaled down to the market that it's actually aimed at. Hopefully that makes sense. Now, the big issue with the RTX 3050 is getting hold of one, and for a reasonable price point. I mean, it's still a lot harder than the getting hold of the 6500 XT. You could buy one of these right now for almost MSRP. So what should you do? Well, in all honesty, I would still advise waiting for cards to drop in price just a little more, of which they are actually doing. But there's still, I guess, a little bit of a way to go. Now, the question there is how long should you wait? Well, with talk of new AMD cards coming later on in the year, it's gonna be a gamble regardless, as you don't wanna end up buying a card to then find out it's obsolete shortly after. Though the same could, I guess, be said about anything these days, including CPUs, GPUs, motherboards with different chipsets, and pretty much every major component. So yes, it's a very, very, very tricky one. 
If however you are in the market right now, like at this specific moment in time for a new GPU, or maybe you're building your very first PC, then the RTX 3050 is the logical choice. Even with its slightly inflated price over the 6500 XT, it just offers more in all areas. And while the 6500 XT, I guess, could show that it could compete in terms of power, thermals, and acoustics, in my opinion, it's just not enough. And you could argue that even in those areas, that's more of what Sapphire have done with the card as opposed to AMD and their core and reference spec. Of course, the other option is to still maybe head on over to Facebook Marketplace or eBay and buy something older, but for around the same kind of price. But then that comes with its own little problems. Like you still have the risk of buying a card that used to be used for mining. No one wants that. Having no warranty, which again, X mining card could be a catastrophe and even then potentially even getting scammed. So there we have it. I mean, I know it's still a bit of an odd one, especially when pricing and availability is so different between the two cards, but hopefully this video has given you maybe more of an idea as to where your money should be best spent, or if you should maybe wait to see what's around the corner and what the future holds. Obviously everyone is different, but I'm at least hoping that this has maybe given you some, maybe more things to think about. And ultimately, I guess only you can really make that last decision as to if you're gonna buy now with this one, buy maybe in the future, or even just wait a little bit longer, depending on what you're after and what you're actually gonna go for. So with that in mind, hopefully you enjoyed this video. And if you did, and you know, if it helped you, consider supporting us through Patreon. The link is down below. And it gives you access to a whole host of goodies, including access to a special area on our Discord, behind the scenes content, our bi-weekly games night, and so much more. We also have all of the charts for this on there as well. Other than that, if you did like this video, you know exactly what to do, and I'll see you in the next one. And let me know if you like these head-to-head -head videos. Maybe we'll do some more. See you later, guys. Bye-bye.